Um, welcome everyone to uh, MARAEA, the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association, uh, for our monthly uh, educational presentation. Um, throughout the year, we provide approximately 10 of these educational presentations. Topics range from renewable energy, of course, but also sustainable living. And as in tonight's, um, more along the lines of botany and plants and gardening, uh, but it's all, all related. Um, anyone wants to uh, talk about joining or helping out with Murray and in, in these kind of presentations, uh, please get in touch with any one of us. Um, you can do that through our website, the Marea.org. Um, tonight we have um, David Jackson, who will be talking about invasive plant species. It's a, a very important topic. And uh, just in talking to David and doing a little research of my own, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to learn how much of this stuff is going on and the impact it makes um, all around us that we don't realize. So David, David Jackson, he is currently an arborist with uh, cutting edge tree professionals in Center County, Pennsylvania. Uh, pro he, um, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse, Syracuse, New York, in the fields of forest resource management and forest biology. He also completed a Master's of Forest Resources at the Pennsylvania State University. Um, before coming to Penning Edge, uh, David worked as a forest resources educator specialist with the Penn State Extension out of Center County. Um, and this is how I came across David. Um, at the Penn State Extension, he published over 40 videos and publications on invasive species. So I'm sure there's a lot of more, David, there's probably a lot of other publications out there about other related topics as well. Um, additionally, David worked with the uh, U.S. Forest Service in uh, far-flung areas such as Montana, Vermont, and of course, Pennsylvania. He also worked in, in Oregon. He worked with the University of Kentucky on their teaching and research forest. He also worked with the Virginia Department of Forestry. Um, he helped manage 35,000 acres of land in the Eastern Catskill Mountains of New York. Um, currently, he's a member of the Society of American Foresters, the Pennsylvania Association of National Resource Extension Professionals, Pennsylvania Forestry Association. In 2010, he received the Sandy Cochran Award for Excellence in Natural Resources Education from the Pennsylvania Forestry Association. And then he also received the Tree Farm Leadership Award from the American Forest Foundation. So it sounds like David's a very, very busy guy and we're uh, happy to have him tonight. So welcome, David. All right, thank you, Tom, appreciate it. Yep, nice to be here. So thank you for the invitation. So <clears throat> yeah, I have changed careers. I did spend the last 20 and a half years with Penn State Extension and uh, decided to jump ship and I'm working for a tree company now, I'm a certified arborist to the International Society of Arboriculture. I do have a passion about invasives. We talk about invasives really as a broad term, really what we're trying to focus on are invasive plants specifically. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and, and we will go ahead and get started here. So I'll put in a plug here, this presentation I've given many times, but this one specifically came out of our Woods in Your Backyard program. So we did a webinar series as well as face-to-face -face workshops, as well as a publication um, entitled The Woods in Your Backyard. And it covered a broad range of topics, but this was certainly one of them and probably one of the most impactful that folks could really grab onto and make a difference on their own properties, especially if they own these small woodlots or even just small lots in general. This is something that all of us can learn to identify these plants and begin to control them and really make a huge impact in the environment. And so we'll go ahead and, and get rolling here. We'll just start with a couple of definitions so that we know that we're all on the same page here. So an invasive is a plant which grows and spreads aggressively and displaces native vegetation. And an executive order 
was defined and said it had to basically have these two criteria. So it's a species that's not native or alien to the ecosystem under consideration. So it's not a native plant to where you're finding it growing. And then number two, has to cause or be likely to cause economic, environmental, or, or harm to human health. And so the plants that we're going to talk about tonight really do cause environmental harm. Uh, there are others certainly that do cause some of the other factors there. And they come in all forms, trees, shrubs, vine, grasses, forbs. And so you can find them in all different plant forms. Um, just to contrast that with some other definitions here. So a non-native plant is a plant that didn't originally occur in the area where it's now established. It occurs outside this area of origin. But not all non-native plants are invasive. And that's, that's an important distinction to make. So we can have plants that aren't native but don't have these invasive characteristics, which I'll go over here in a moment. Things like Norway spruce, Chinese kusa dog, but aren't native plants, certainly. And some of them are naturalized, but they're not invasive. And then there's a, a legal designation, which we call noxious. And these are plants determined to be injurious to public health, crops, livestock, agricultural land. They cannot be sold, transported, planted, or otherwise propagated in our state. And so when a plant like Tree of Heaven, for example, gets the noxious designation, which it means basically that we can no longer sell it in our nurseries. And that determination is made by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And it was really focused originally on agricultural land, but now they have really stepped outside of that box and we're seeing a lot more of these invasive plants that are invading our woodlands, uh, making it onto the noxious weed list. And a, and a number of them have been added just recently. So what are the characteristics that make these plants invasive? And, and the first one is really the key is because these plants aren't native to where we're finding them growing. They don't have the native controls that were in their you know, countries of origin. They don't have the insects. They don't have the diseases, the herbivores, or even the other plant competitors to keep them in check. So it allows them to just be uh, proliferate. Um, an old colleague of mine, he used to say they're ubiquitous, which means they're, we find them everywhere, but it's because of these characteristics that you're, they're ubiquitous. Uh, reproduce prolifically, they, they um, have rapid early growth forms, mature quickly, produce large numbers of seeds, sprout or re-sprout readily. And these are generalizations, so not every invasive plant has all of these characteristics, but in general, this is what we see that makes them so competitive. And, and they spread aggressively by seeds, roots, and shoots. They disperse away from the parent plant. So whether it's birds or mammals, you know, ingesting seeds and dispersing them, whether the wind's blowing it, water, even on humans, whether it's on our clothing, on our equipment, on our vehicles, things like that, they tend to disperse away from the parent uh, plant. The seeds can remain viable for years. Many of them are in the three to five year range, but some remain viable for decades. Uh, they spread to disturb sites readily, so they're very disturbance oriented oftentimes. So log sites, rights of ways, roadsides, mine sites, abandoned agricultural land, old home sites we often find heavily invaded with invasive plants. They have wide site tolerances, shade, drought, poor soils, flooding. Uh, they tend to leaf out early in the spring and shed later in the fall. So we're just seeing them in many parts of Pennsylvania, those early plants that are leafing out now. Um, tend to be the invasive ones and non-native ones. And so if you want to learn to identify them, now's a great time because they're popping out their leaves and you'll be able to pick them up, especially in the, in the southeastern part of the state and the southern part of the state. Um, some suppress other plants by releasing chemicals. So Tree of Heaven, for example, actually has allelopathic properties similar to um, our black walnut tree. So it's not the same chemical, but it does release chemicals that can prevent our plants from growing around it. Here's an interesting uh, map that just shows you the forested areas of our state. So ignore the grassland areas, but look at the forested areas because this is uh, data that's done through the uh, US Forest Service Forest Inventory and Analysis. And it's basically showing the percent of the forest land that is invaded by non-native plants. And when you see the redder colors, that's the higher invaded areas. So you can see states like Alaska is only 6% invaded, but you get down the Southeast, they're up there in, in New England and the Northeast there, we're at 45%. And what it highlights to me is areas that are more fragmented, 
areas that are more populated tend to have a lot more invasive plants just because of the people factor. So if you go up in the north central Pennsylvania in the big woods country, you can see it's still green. So very, very low invasion there. Or even up in Maine, you can see almost the whole state is still green. But get down you know, to where we have people around the whole uh, southwestern part of our state and it's all red, very fragmented woodlots, lots of lots of people living in those areas. And so you can see how they kind of tie into populations. Pennsylvania's woods are about 64% invaded with invasive plants. And then just to put some of this in perspective, so it was reported 2019, 1,538 invasive plants reported across the US. And the RDCNR, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources in 2021 had listed on their website, 106 different species of terrestrial plants. Now they rank them based on their invasive um, characteristics and how invasive they actually are. So they're not all these worst invaders, but still to put in perspective, there's 106 different plants listed on that list. We're just gonna scratch the surface on some of the most problematic plants tonight. So I'll ask you a question here and you can just think about it because I'm not gonna have you type in the chat, but, but, but based on this forest service inventory and analysis data, what invasive plant do you think is the most commonly encountered in Pennsylvania's woodlands? So give that thought a moment here and I'll let you come up with an answer in your head here. And then I'll give you what the data actually showed here. So what do you think is the most commonly encountered invasive plant in Pennsylvania's woodlands or natural areas even? Here, I'll show you the, the data here. And, and I have to look at this chat because it actually is showing up and blocking my screen. So the multiflora rose was the number one plant, 47.4% of the uh, plots actually had multiflora rose and then it goes down from there, bush honeysuckle, garlic mustard, Japanese barberry, still grass and so on down the list there. Um, and so you can see uh, what we have in comparison here to our neighbors. So Ohio, 93% invaded. So think about the woodlands in Ohio, very fragmented versus New York State has some very large tracks with the Adirondacks and Catskills, 51% invaded. And of course the plots in the southern half of Pennsylvania had the greatest numbers. A lot more people living in southeastern and southwestern Pennsylvania. So invasive plant impacts degrade uh, native environments, displaced native plant communities. So this, this slide here, and actually the next couple here is really where I, I ask us, so why do we care? You know, we have all these invasive plants. Why should, why should we care about them? And why should we do something uh, to lessen their impact? So the first one, we know they degrade native environments. It's in the definition of invasive plants. They displace our native plants. So they outcompete them and displace them. What that does is that decreases, and we'll use the word biodiversity. So a decrease in the number of plants, we're going to impact the number of wildlife species that can use those areas, areas as well. So decreased diversity. Uh, they can inhibit forest regeneration success. So if you see where they invade old fields or areas that were harvested, it can actually inhibit those areas from from going through succession and inhibit those areas from actually regenerating areas. So I've seen old fields that were abandoned from farmland that just grow up entirely in invasive shrubs and just halt succession right there in that shrub stage. Um, they degrade wildlife habitats. So they're very poor food producers. So rarely is the foliage browsed or eaten on these plants. Uh, and if you see deer eating this stuff, it's basically a last resort. And there are other foods that they would much prefer to eat, but they don't exist in their habitats. Um, they've shown that the seeds and berries on a lot of these invasive shrubs, for example, are very low in the, uh, the fats and the carbohydrates that songbirds, for example, need for their winter migrations. And so they're kind of like getting the chocolate Hershey's bar without the meat and the potatoes. And so that's been shown through research. And the last one is one I really hit on here is they're very poor insect producers. So insects, our native insects tend to be very specific to the plants that they've evolved to feed upon. 
And uh, we rarely find them feeding on these non-native plants. And this has a direct impact on the food web. So in insects are the foundation for that food web. And if we're not producing insects because our habitats are covered by invasive plants and non-native plants in general, we're not producing that bottom level of the food web. And so here's a quote from uh, Melissa Ricard and Doug Talme from the University of Delaware. And I think he may have been one of your speakers even at one time. And if he, if he hasn't been on, you ought to see if you can get him to come on here because he's done some really groundbreaking work around non-native plants and, the, and the, how the, the insects that aren't produced are, are missing there. But we found that introduced species like autumn olive, multiflora rosa, and lists a whole host of species here. All these are invasive plants. Japanese honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, oriental bittersweet, porcelain berry, calorie pear, which by the way, just got listed on the noxious weed list, bamboo, and Japanese knotweed are exceptionally poor host plants for caterpillars, supporting few to no species under natural invasion field conditions. And so all these plants are very poor food producers. And so here's a chart showing just the number of butterfly and moth species supported on different species. And so we start on this end of the spectrum with our oaks, the Quercus and cherry, willow, birch, and even moving all the way down here, we'll, we'll ignore the chestnut because there's not much chestnut left anymore, but walnuts, beeches, uh, rosaceae, there's ash, basswood, and this is simply the number of moth and butterfly species. So Lepidoptera, if we look at oaks, we're over 500 different moth, moth and butterfly species hosted on the various oak species. And even out here, we're still up over a hundred different species. And if we, um, well, I'll just make this statement here. Oaks support more wildlife than any other plant. So looking at this, uh, absolutely. Compare that to the invasive tree of heaven. So how many uh, moth and butterfly species are hosted on tree of heaven? I'm not aware of um, any but one. And I confirmed this with Doug Talme, actually. And so I can think of two insects that are definitely hosted on tree of heaven, and both of them aren't native. So some of you may be currently dealing with the spotted lanternfly, right? So another invasive plant, it, Tree of Heaven was found in spotted lanternfly homeland. And so that's why it's attracted to that plant and that's why it uses it. But there's another one, uh, the, the um, well, it's a web worm um, that we find using Tree of Heaven actually moved north from down uh, south in Florida even. So as Tree of Heaven expanded its range, this webworm actually moved up with Tree of Heaven and now we find it here. So we can look at uh, just two uh, species of insects that are hosted specifically on Tree of Heaven and complete their life cycle on it versus more than 500 on our oaks. And so here's really why you should care because 95% of all terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And so when our habitats, when our yards, when our natural areas, when our woodlands are covered with these invasive plants, we're not producing bugs. And if we're not producing bugs, particularly caterpillar and moth larva, um, or butterfly and moth larva, caterpillars, uh, we're not producing baby birds. And so that whole food web just crashes when these uh, plants completely take over areas. And so think about your yard, think about your natural areas around where your home is and how many plants that you have there that are non-native. And then not just non-native, how many of them are invasive. And I use my home here as an example where I have an acre and a half. When I bought it, the entire acre and a half was mowed lawn or driveway or my house. Um, I have let go of probably an acre of it and I manage it by um, controlling the invasive plants, so constantly removing them. So I've removed hundreds and hundreds of invasive plants just off that acre property to try to grow uh, native plants because I have a lot of songbirds that use my property. So what about deer and invasive plants? The fact that we have too many deer, this is another quote from Doug Talmay at the University of Delaware. 
The fact that we have too many deer is the most important feature that encourages invasive plants in our forest. So if we go to areas and particularly, you know, even I'll say states, and it'll be that broad of a statement, if we go to states where there's fewer deer in our woodlands, we find fewer invasive plant problems. And this is from Bern Blossie from Cornell University and David Gorchon from Miami University they worked on research on invasive plants. And he says that uh, they both say, invasive plant species removal without deer reduction is certain to fail in most instances or result in only minor improvements. And so that's a pretty dramatic statement there that uh, we really have a problem with deer overabundance is just gonna encourage more invasive plants. And the reason being is that deer eat out all the native plants. So they're just like these caterpillars, they wanna, they wanna feed on the native plants that they evolved with. Seldom do they browse on non-native species. There's a few that they'll find favored, but they're typically finding them as a last resort. And if they're taking out the native plants, it's just allowing invasive plants to be even more prolific. So here's a couple of books by uh, Doug Talmy. If you wanna read more about this, and you can find these online. Bringing, Bringing Nature Home was the first one that he published, and then Nature's Best Hope. And he even has a third one out that talks specifically about oak trees and the importance of oak trees on the landscape. And so let's shift gears a little bit here now. So hopefully that's motivated you to say, okay, now what am I going to do about it? I have these invasive plants. And I'll show you some resources here at the end where you can learn to identify some of these things, but how are you going to control them? And so we talk about this integrated approach, um, integrated pest management. In this case, we're going to say it's integrated vegetation management. And so we look at it kind of as a pyramid with cultural at the bottom and chemical at the top of the pyramid. So let's touch upon each one of these. So these are the different types of cultural controls. I call it indirect weed management. So how do we enhance the growth of desirable plants um, and basically keep these invasive plants out? We wanna utilize proper management practices. So this, this was geared around forest land, but certainly utilizing proper management practices, whether we're managing forest lands, natural areas, uh, even our, our yards, our lawns, things like that, we can definitely encourage native plants that way. Reduce that deer impact. We just heard that we've got to get deer impacts down or, or native plants just aren't even going to be able to grow, even if we control the invasives. Uh, we can prevent the spread of undesirable plants. So that's a biggie. That's a cultural control method. We monitor areas, educate neighbors that, hey, you know, that's a tree of heaven out there and it's a, it's a female. It's throwing thousands of seeds all over the place. How about we figure out a way to get rid of that tree? Uh, plant native plants. So anytime that you're talking to someone about what the plant in their yard, you know, what, what's a great plant? Let's focus on native plants first so we don't start any new problems. Uh, reduce seed spread by cleaning your equipment, stopping soil movement, you know, checking our, our machinery, things like that, and making sure that we're not moving seed and not moving soil that might be contaminated with seed. Uh, minimize disturbance, reclaim areas quickly. So this is a Japanese stiltgrass uh, stem with seeds on it that got actually attached to somebody's pant leg. Uh, this is a black gum seedling outside of a fence. This is the black gum inside the fence. This landowner didn't think the deer were having any impact on his woodlands. And I put up these demonstration fences and he was convinced now that he needed to harvest more deer as a result of just seeing this. Uh, this was another little deer exclosure where he had some really unique plants growing in here and he wanted to make sure that they weren't eliminated by the deer. So little fences like that can be really important if you don't have an opportunity to really control deer numbers. And then of course, you know, these kinds of things can certainly spread seeds all over the place. So what about manual? or mechanical means of controlling. So this is, you know, hand pulling, cutting, uh, directed flame weeding, like you see up there, um, you know, using machinery like this to mow it. Uh, most times I think about these methods as providing access, but if you do them often enough, you can actually starve the, the plant of the carbohydrates that the foliage makes. And so if you starve the root systems enough and often enough, um, you can actually kill the plant. It's very difficult to do. And most times mowing, for example, doesn't create the kind of habitats that we're looking for. So typically I tell people, if we're going to mow it, we're going to mow it one time. 
then we're going to go back in with other means like chemical, for example, and treat re-sprouts. So understand just cutting these things, often kid with people and say, oh, you're just going to make it mad. You're going to cut it down and you're going to turn it in into a whole pile of sprouts afterwards. So recognize that cutting is really a, a one-time shot where you're going to just be re-sprouting this stuff, even flame weeding. And sometimes that you're going to have to do it multiple times in order to actually get control of that plant. And then what about things like this solarization or smothering things with cardboard and newspaper or black plastic? There's not very many instances in our natural areas or in our forest that invasive plants lend itself to this kind of control method. This is really for gardening. This is for in your yard areas. You know, most of the invasive plants are dealing, we're dealing with are not gonna lend themselves to this kind of control. on a lot of these plants and but really that, that's the key a lot of people love these uh love goats right but goats are non-selective uh, they will just as readily browse out all the native vegetation as they will the invasive plants uh, goats have to be protected they have to be fenced they have to be watered and so they can be very expensive and very time consuming uh, you have to move them around. So once the vegetation is browsed down, you have to move them out to new areas. And typically what happens is it just sprouts back. And so without some other form of control to follow, again, to me, they're like mowing where they can provide you access and you need to follow that up with some other means like chemical. So that lands me here and I talk about herbicide. This is a colleague of mine, Art Gover. Art Gover spent a career at Penn State uh, studying invasive plants and chemical control methods and really was the foundation for a lot of the fact sheets that we later published there at Penn State and some of the online videos that we did. So I say herbicides are gonna be by far your most productive approach with, with limited time, energy, manpower, money, uh, by far, putting your money and effort into this method is going to lead to the best results. Uh, the most effective, as I said, Art spent a career studying uh, what products to use, what time of year to use them at, what rates to apply them at, what methods to apply them at. And we know how to control these plants and we can be very effective at it. And I say they're selective. So we have selective application methods. So even what he's doing there with a backpack spray, selectively treating the invasive plants in this area and not treating the native, like you see the elm in the upper corner or the, the rubus briars there in the foreground. We can selectively take out the autumn olives that he's spraying. We even have more selective methods like hack and squirt or stump treatments or basal bark treatments where the herbicide is only being applied to that plant. But we also have some selective herbicide chemistry too that will only affect seeds that germinate, for example, or will only affect grasses or will only affect broadleaves. And so we can be selective, not only in our application method, but even in the chemistry that we choose. And then I say necessary because if we look back at many of these other control measures, they're often not that effective and we have to land here if we really want to be effective at controlling these plants. And I'll give you an example here. You think about the black plastic. I saw research uh, that was being worked on recently in the Delaware River watershed where Japanese knotweed was starting to really gain control along the banks of the Delaware, especially the upper stretches there. And they were finding that black plastic was super effective. But think about the impracticality of that along a river bank that could flood peri periodically, for example. In the miles and miles of rivers that we have and streams that we have in Pennsylvania, if you've ever been up to Cinnamahoney, uh, you know, the west branch of the Susquehanna is literally bank to bank, you know, just covered with knotweed. There's, there's no way that you could put black plastic down in those areas. And if it flooded, just think of the disaster that you'd have with 
with plastic washing downstream. And so we have to be cognizant of the practicality of some of these methods that we're looking at. Certainly on a small scale on your property, for example, it may be effective, but, but on a grand scale, it can be very difficult. So here's some of the methods that we can apply herbicides at, um, foliar spot treatments, basal bark treatments where we're just treating uh, the bark actually without even cutting the plant down, the herbicide is absorbed right through the bark of the stem uh, into the vascular system of the tree or the shrub. Um, hack and squirt or ax frill where we're taking a hatchet and making a down or an angle cut and then putting a herbicide in those cuts. And you can see how selective that is. The herbicide is only going into the stem that you're trying to control. And then the last one there are stump treatments. So we cut it down and we treat the, the stump surface. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about where these application methods come into play here. So only a few things you really need to get started if you wanna to try to do some of this work on your own property. And there's lots of good fact sheets that we produced on the Penn State Extension website. But your things you need a backpack sprayer, I would invest in the shoulder saver harness for it. So take the old harness that comes off it, invest in that. It's gonna be a lot more comfortable for you. If you're gonna do hack and squirt, you need a hatchet and a spray bottle. The personal protective clothing that we're talking about using is really just rubber boots, you know, long pants, long sleeve shirt, rubber gloves, eye protection. Uh, there's a couple of products that you could use that, that are hazardous to your, your eyes and your skin. So you do wanna cover that, but honestly, most of what we use is not. And uh, the eye protection is more for you walking in, in the brush there when you're not really focused on what you're, you're, where you're focused on what you're spraying rather than watching where you're going more. So um, personal protective equipment for some of the products doesn't require you to wear rubber gloves. And so, um, you know, that's basically the maximum of what you're gonna need, what you see me wearing in that picture there. So basil wand, if you're gonna do a lot of basil bark treating on base of shrubs, for example, some good leak proof storage containers, and then some different nozzles and check valves would be helpful depending on what you're, what you're actually doing. And so what do I use? Really just three active ingredients can pretty much get you control of most every invasive plant that you're gonna encounter. There's a few little things here and there, but for the most part, glyphosate, triclopyr, and sulfometromethyl um, in a number of different uh, products is gonna get you what you need. Oftentimes we're mixing the couple of these products together even. Caveat being that they have to be labeled for use in your state and they have to be labeled for use on the site that you're applying them to. So not every glyphosate product, for example, is labeled to be applied in the forest. And so you want to make sure that you're purchasing the uh, product that is labeled for the site that you are applying it in. And then I will tell you that all of these products in Pennsylvania are not restricted use, which means you can purchase them over the counter and you can apply them to your own property without certification. That's not saying every state's that way, make sure you check your, your state's regulations, but in Pennsylvania, these active ingredients are not restricted. So a lot of folks want to say, well, geez, how about this acetic acid, this vinegar? Let me just tell you a little bit about it because a lot of folks are talking about it. It's non-selective. Um, it's a contact herbicide. And so what you spray it on, it can burn that foliage. Uh, it's, it does not like it's only going to work on broad leaves or only work on grasses. So it's non-selective, a broad spectrum. It's non-systemic, which means it doesn't get absorbed into the plant and move to the root system. It's basically just burning what you spray. So if you miss spraying some of it, you won't control those particular leaves. It has no residual activity. So if it gets on the ground, it's not going to be taken up by root systems. It's not going to affect seeds that are germinating in the soil. And so a lot of these seeds, a lot of these plants have tremendous seed banks, like Japanese stiltgrass. So you won't touch the seed bank in the next year to look like you didn't do anything out there. Uh, does require a surfactant or a sticking agent to get it into the plant. Uh, symptoms are visible rapidly, controls seedlings, annual broadleaf weeds. Um, and it really only burns the foliage of perennial weeds and large annual weeds and grasses. So some of these 
these perennial shrubs and such, you're just burning foliage off and they're just gonna come right back out. But basically one of the things I wanna tell you that, um, you know, this is a natural pesticide, but it doesn't, oh, natural doesn't always mean that it's safe. So vinegar has a danger on the label. The signal word is danger and danger means that severe eye irritation burns are impossible, irreversible damage potential. So vinegars with acetic acid concentrated 11% or greater can burn the skin and cause severe eye injury, including blindness. And that's right out of the uh, University of Maryland's extensions publication. And so be aware of that. So just because you think it's natural doesn't always mean that it's safe. And so where do you start? How do I get started on this? And I like to put them into three different categories. And so to me, the most important thing is to work in the least invaded areas. First, I have so many people that would call me and say, you know, I have this huge dense infestation. I can't even get in there to get started. And I said, well, that's not where you want to start. You want to start in areas that don't have invasive plants. We want to keep them that way. So we want to save the best. best. We want to prevent areas from being invaded. We want to start where the populations of invasive plants are the smallest. Those areas are easy to maintain. They have very low impact of invasive plants and we can preserve those communities very easily. Then we wanna work in areas that have native plants still in place and we can rescue those plants. So the native plants have not yet been displaced. And then lastly, if we get all that done and we still have some energy and some time and some money, then we're going to start to restore these areas that are just completely dominated by invasives. So these areas are completely occupied with invasives. No native plants are left. And this is really the most difficult jobs that we're talking about to restore these areas that are just completely dominated. So keep that hierarchy in mind as you begin your work here. And so lastly, I'm going to go very quickly because I see my time is going by here. I like to just cover some of these invasive plant profiles. This information is all in our fact sheet series that we, we put together at Penn State Extension. So if you go to the Penn State Extension website, I'll show you at the end here, you'll be able to find all these different fact sheets as Tom alluded to. We also have Learn Now videos, uh, a lot of them on identification and a handful of them on controlling these plants as well. But I just wanna show you some characteristics and we're gonna basically go through a grass, an annual grass, an annual vine, a perennial vine, a perennial forb, some shrubs and, and a land on a tree there and try to wrap things up here very quickly. So I'm gonna go, go pretty quickly through this with the understanding that you're gonna be able to get all this stuff um, online as well. So this is an interesting plant, Japanese stilt grass. You can see in the image here, this is where it gets its name from these stilt roots. Plants can grow to two, four, I've even, seen um, stems almost uh, five feet tall, but this is an annual grass. So it starts from seed every spring. The seeds are probably germinating already in some of the warmer parts of the state. One of the real neat characteristics is this silvery white line kind of off center on the midrib of the leaf. This is a Pennsylvania no a noxious weed, um, very shade tolerant. You can see where it gets started on roadsides and the seed just blows down the road. Five year seed viability. So you have a, a tremendous seed bank here to be contending with when you try to control this plant. This is what it looks like in the winter time. It turns all brown, these big dead brown mats of stilt grass, which really can inhibit other plants. But the, the seeds here and the, the seeds from the plant will just come right up through that every spring. So there's no mechanical means, it's very practical. I've seen someone try to use a, a string trimmer in their small wood lot and literally you miss one plant and you don't address the seed bank at all. And it just came back the next year. It was like throwing money on the ground, literally. There's no biological control means. And so you're literally looking at some of these um, chemical controls. So using products that have activity on that seed bank. And so that's where that sulfometrone methyl comes into play because it has soil activity. And so as those seeds are germinating in the soil, it's picking that up and controlling the plant. And if it's already emerged, uh, you can control it. So there's a no number of other options, pre-emergent options or emergent options that are grass specific or general products like glyphosate, which is non-selective and would 
control other plants in those areas as well if there was anything else growing there but in all of our publications we have these um, these tables like this where you can see when the timing is for treatments uh, if you're going to pull it or cut it when the timing is for that um, and then we also have some of the herbicide treatment tables as well very specific that you can look at so this is another one that's super difficult to, con to control because it's seed banks as well, mile and minute vine, annual vine that can grow 20 to 30 feet in length in one growing season. As these triangular shaped leaves, when the seeds are ripe, they, they turn that dark blue or almost a purple color. And there's little thorns all on the stems here. This one will grab you when you're walking through it for sure. Uh, full sunlight, though, this one's not shade tolerant, needs open areas in the sun. So one way to control this would be just to make sure that it doesn't uh, kill the trees by just suffocating them here. Keep the trees there, keep the shade on it, and you can keep it under control. Oh, and we have the distinction of discovering wild minute vine in our state initially. Uh, keys to control, prevent it from going to seed. Treat it when it's small, treat it early in the season and be persistent because the seed that falls to the ground has a seed bank of at least five years. It does pull easily. I've pulled a lot of this where I've found infestations on some of the Penn State lands that I managed prior to this job. Um, but you wanna wear long sleeve shirts. This right here, you'll be all scratched up by the day if you're pulling it out. You'll read that says to bag the plants with seeds, but what I found, if you're pulling plants with seeds, a lot of the seeds are falling off onto the ground and you just know you're going to be back there next year to pull it again and try to keep it from suffocating the native plants. Uh, there is uh, some hope with a biological treatment here. This Chinese weevil has been introduced in some areas. I personally have not seen it be successful in areas, but I know I've talked to some folks that have said it's been very successful on their properties. So typically we're talking about using herbicide or chemical controls with either pre or post emergent products. I like the sulfametro methyl again because this has that soil activity is going to work on that seed bank. If you're in this time of year, you're at this non-selective treatment, you know, using broader spectrum products like glyphosate and triclopyr. You know, and here's the timing tables. Like I said, you're going to find these in the Penn State Extension fact sheet. So it shows when to treat it, what the rates are, what products to use, things like that that you'll find there. Uh, this is my least favorite invasive plant, Oriental Bittersweet. This is an incredible plant. It's just absolutely blowing up here in Center County. I think we're just seeing it scratching the surface right now. And it's just amazing in the time that I've lived here, how, um, how um, it has just started to dominate all our work woodland edges, 60 feet tall, six inches in diameter. It'll grow as big around as your thigh. I've seen some just been tremendous. Uh, these are the berries, they, they split open and show the orange seeds inside there. It's a twining vine. It can climb up the biggest trees in the woodlot. Don't confuse it with American bittersweet, although American does have very, very similar characteristics as far as its strangling ability on our native trees. But native um, bittersweet actually only seeds at the ends of the branches. So if you find, I've only seen two in my whole career. One a sample somebody brought me when I actually found growing in the wild. But the invasive actually seeds at every leaf node. So at every place you have a leaf, you could have a little cluster of seeds. And so it kind of sticks with that definition of invasive where these are producing way more seeds than the American bittersweet does. So it does prefer open sunny sites, field edges, uh, wildlife spread the seeds, it root suckers. You see a lot of this, you know, arts and crafts kinds of things. And people are done with that. They just throw it back in the woods and it spreads, the seeds germinate and it spreads all over the place. This is a PA noxious weed as well. Um, mechanical control, really difficult to pull because it's a root suckering vine. A lot of times you just end up breaking it. In fact, if I find it on my little property here, I usually just mark it and I come back with some herbicide because I know if I pull it, I'm just going to break the root off and it's going to sprout back anyways. So cut vines re-sprout from stumps and roots. Mowing promotes root suckers 
and the seeds remain viable in the soil for years. No biological control. And you can see what it's doing to this tree right here. And so chemical control is the option. It's a root sprouting species, so only late season application. So you get herbicide moving downward to control the roots. Typically, I say this is a two-step approach. And if you really only got the first step, you'd be doing something, which means we're cutting the aerial vines. And so where these vines are growing up into the trunks of the trees, cut them off. And so you're killing that entire aerial portion. So if you just cut these vines down here, all of this up here dies. Uh, no need to pull it out, just let it dry and die on its own time. But ultimately these are gonna re-sprout down here. And so the idea being that you would cut this like this time of year, great time to go out and cut and then come back in mid to late summer and do a foliar treatment on the re-sprouts. You can hack and squirt it, you can stump treat it, and you can even do basal bark treatments if it's separated from the trees and not uh, twined tightly around the trunk. So lots of different options there for it. Um, but note here that all of our applications for root suckering species uh, don't start until July. So we want to get that downward movement to the roots. This is actually a, a woodland edge in Center County where you can see this vine just completely overtopped all the trees on that edge. Japanese knotweed, this is an herbaceous perennial. So now we move from these, these annuals to perennial herbs. It has a hollow stems that resemble bamboo, but it's herbaceous, not woody like bamboo. It has these beautiful flowers on it. Then unfortunately, a lot of our uh, native bees and such, and, and even our non-native honeybees actually love. And I've had some people say, well, how would I kill it? There's, you know, the bees use it like crazy. That's why I want to grow it. They get honey from it, et cetera. But I will tell you this plant is displacing native plants that those insects would be using and probably even prefer over this particular one. Grows almost anywhere from acidic mine spoil and full sun to shaded alluvial soils along rivers and streams. Oof, that scared me. Uh, this is uh, growing along the cinema honing in Pennsylvania. I've seen it all over up in, up in Canada. So this plant is very, very prolific. Also Pennsylvania noxious weed as well. Don't mow it, it'll just come back. It'll just keep spreading. Um, contaminated soils I've seen moved into our roadsides on projects and just spreading it that way from the rhizome fragments. I've seen it scattered all through farmers fields from being uh, caught on plows and such and moved all through fields and from one field to another another field even. No biological control. That's the rhizome. It's these big nodules underneath these plants and then it spreads a root out and starts a whole new little cluster like that. Really tough to control that rhizome. You've got to get downward herbicide movement. We typically talk about this one as a two-stage approach as well. So you cut it to the ground, wait about two months, let it regrow and then you treat that it's going to only grow back so high so you can see in this lower picture where it's not cut where it's cut it's only this tall now it's thigh high where you can spray it where otherwise it's eight or ten feet high very very difficult to get good coverage on it where something like this that you can the cutting also forces it to re-sprout and use up a lot of reserves in that root system this is what it looks like after you treat it. You can see it's not over yet, not even close. If you were to walk away from this, this would completely um, be covered back up. So be persistent on this thing and come back and treat these re-sprouts. Uh, there's the treatment and timing table. So you can look at that online and, and study the what and when the treatments are. We'll move into some of the shrubs here. And, um, this is one probably most of you know, Japanese barber. It, to me, this is probably the one that is the most common in our forest because it will grow in shady understories where multiflora rose is an edge or an open field type of species, but has these little spines, little red berries that birds spread all over the place, small spoon shaped leaves. And so you can see it here. Look at the understory and you know, beautiful fall colors. That's why we, we use use it in the landscape trade, but you can see what it does in our woodlands. Another Pennsylvania noxious weed. Not practical to pull these things 
it's just too spiny of a plant and it deep, it's deep rooted. So really this is a foliar application or basil bark, or you cut it and treat the stubble. Neat picture down here. This was actually one I treated with a basil bark application. We're getting the spray wand in there and just spraying stems. But this is an oak seedling right here that you can be that selective in your application methods on these things. So shrub honeysuckle, another one, you can identify these because of the, uh, the hollow stems. There's a number of different species. Here's moros, here's a mirror. These are probably the two of the most common ones that we see around here, uh, opposite branching. So don't confuse them with our native dogwoods or viburnums. Uh, intolerant of shade also. So these are grown on the edges or out in open woodlands or old field sites, particularly huge distribution, this plant. Shallow rooted though. So this one actually is pretty easy to pull. And when I get small plants in my property, I, I almost always just hand pull them. They're that shallow rooted. Now uh, easy to, to basil bark these, spray foliage, treat cut stumps. If you wanna be very um, specific with your treatments. And then the last shrub we'll talk about here is autumn olive. So learn to identify this from the silvery undersides to the leaves. Uh, even the fruits here have these little silvery speckled scales on them. So easy to identify this one, autumn olive. Um, does prefer dry conditions. Um, it's been planted all over mine sites through um, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, West Virginia. Uh, it is a nitrogen fixer. The birds disperse the, the seeds all over the place. Um, Mechanical birding, cutting, girdling will not control this plant. I actually took a, a hoe one time and, and cut the roots all around a plant, dug it out, and everywhere I cut the root, it sprouted a new plant. So very difficult to control. So typically, again, you're looking at foliar treatments. You can, you can or chemical treatments, you can spray foliage. You can do basal bark treatments or cut stump treatments on this plant. So for all the invasive shrubs, we basically generalized all of our treatments, a lot broader treatment window because these aren't root suckering species. So you can start once the foliage is completely opened up, we might say wait until June for probably more of our northerly counties in Pennsylvania. Once those leaves are completely open though, you can start doing foliar treatments, basal bark treatments, stump treatments, year round applications on these things. And the last one we'll add, and here's Tree of Heaven. And this one's gotten a lot of press lately because of the spotted lanternfly actually landed on the noxious weed list lately, even though it had been in the state for 200 years. They finally put it on the noxious weed list because of the spotted lanternfly. So it can grow into huge sized trees. I've seen them be you know, four feet in diameter, 80 feet tall. They have separate male and female trees though. So the females are the one that are producing the seeds like you see down here, which is a little winged samara that can blow pretty long distances in the wind. This is one leaf, so it has a compound leaf with leaflets, so don't confuse it with sumac or walnut. Looks a lot like sumac, a lot of folks confuse it with it. But females can produce more than 300,000 seeds a year, and it's a root suckering species. So here's the parent tree, and then it spreads by sending out these root suckers around the parent tree, and it just keeps cloning itself in these little clonal patches. So cutting causes a tree to, uh, to sprout. So you can see this picture right here. That's one year's worth of re-sprouts on an area that was just cut. And so they're almost six feet tall again, just in one growing season. Cultural control contaminates soil, root fragments and seed. You know, root fragment can start this plant growing into a new area. So don't move contaminated soil. We do have that verticillium wilt in our state it's being studied right now to be a biopesticide. There might be someday that we actually have it labeled where we can actually go into a stand and you'll purchase this product and go into a stand of Tree of Heaven and actually treat it and control it with this uh, verticillium wilt. Right now it's not labeled yet or ready to go as far as I understand. And lastly, so we're gonna be looking at treating these things because they're root suckering species late season so July until the onset of fall color, we're gonna be spraying foliage, doing hack and squirt or basil bark, no stump treatments because 
when you cut this tree down, you remove the mechanism that, that would move the herbicide down to that root. And we find we kill the stump, but we don't kill the whole root system and it ends up re-sprouting. And so don't do stump treatments on Tree of Heaven. But there's your treatment and timing window. Uh, this is an interesting picture down here. This was some research where the treatment was done in early spring and all of the herbicide movement was going up in the plant. So we killed all the tops of the trees, but they actually re-sprouted because we got no herbicide movement down to the roots. And so that's where we came up with the timing of these being no earlier than July to get good downward movement of the herbicide. And so in summary, learn to identify invasive plants by scouting properties often, implement control measures immediately where you can pull small investigations and small plants. Uh, herbicides are definitely gonna be your most productive approach. Start in the least invaded areas first and follow up on all treatments is gonna be absolutely necessary. And then move into an annual maintenance program. Uh, this is what our series of fact sheets look like. There's, there's like 13 or 14 of them. I can't even remember now how many we produced, but they all have great photography in there to help you ID the plants and all those treatment and timing tables are in there as well. And this is where you can find it on the Penn State Extension website. There's Learn Now videos as well. So look for all that, that resource on Penn State Extension. So that's all I have for you folks. All right, thanks, David. Um, I think we have questions. Chuck, are you gonna, Chuck and uh, is Joe on? Are you guys gonna take the questions? Yes, um, I can take the first question here. Um, <clears throat> Oriental bittersweet's been around for decades, but now has exploded, why? Yeah, I skipped that slide. So there's actually a slide called the invasion curve. And so if you look at the invasion curve, it's an exponential curve. And so these plants take a long time to get established and begin to spread. But once they're established, we have this exponential growth curve where it just takes off. And so that's what we're seeing with a lot of these plants like Oriental Bittersweet right now. So that is actually a researched uh, curve about invasive plants. You can search it online there. Yeah. Interesting question because I'm seeing the exact same thing. When I moved here 25 years ago, I didn't even know what Oriental Bittersweet was. Now I can show it to you in my front yard. Joe, do you want uh, to get the next one? Sure. Next question is, we had our forest land harvested about 15 years ago. Uh, we used a forest manager and thought we were doing the right thing. Would never do it again. The opened canopy resulted in a mess of invasives. How can harvesting and control of invasives coexist? Well, if you think back to a slide I showed you earlier tonight, it's really a two prongs because I will almost guarantee you that you have an overabundance of deer as well. And that has only proliferated the problem with the invasive plants. And Unfortunately, I mean, you mentioned that you had a forest manager, hard to say exactly who or what that was, but that doesn't mean that things were done correctly. If you don't have advanced seedlings already present on the forest floor and you do a harvest, you're not gonna get good regeneration back. And oftentimes we end up with invasive plants. But if you don't find seedlings already present of good native species already in your understory, you have to do something to get them there first. That might mean controlling deer, that might mean controlling sunlight and getting some light into the understory initially before you just open the canopy up. So there's, there's lots of things that we're dealing with. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I worked here as a forester for over 20 years and it's probably one of the most frustrating things that I encountered because every single property that I went to, guess what they had? An overabundance of deer and invasive plants. Everybody, it's a, it's a ubiquitous problem in our state and it'll never be solved until the game commission becomes a natural resource agency and is tax funded instead of hunter license sale funded. 
So the next one is um, herbicides are a risk for those who have water source as a private well. Is using herbicides a risk? So the products that I have showed you here tonight, I would say are not a risk. For example, glyphosate binds very tightly to soil particles. So it's not moving off site. It's not moving down into your soil. It biodegrades readily, it has a, a very short half-life. And so within five months, it's completely biodegraded by soil mi microbes. And so it's not something that we need to be concerned about there. They have, um, they're all, they measure all pesticides with their lethal dose value. They call it the LD50 value. Uh, they have very high LD50 values. Some are off the charts greater than 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. <clears throat> and so I feel very comfortable personally using them and personally recommending them. In general, are there any organic treatments that are effective? So I illustrated some there. Certainly, you know, we talked about acetic acid. We talked about black plastic. We talked about goats. You know, those are all options. We talked about cutting and pulling, mowing, things like that. So, you know, those options are all illustrated here. Uh, the effectiveness you know, depending on the plant can be vastly different. If you're dealing with a stand of Japanese stilt grass and mile a minute vines can be way different than what I could do here on my acre property dealing with shrub honeysuckle, for example, where if I really wanted to, I could probably have gone out there and just cut it off with a chainsaw and just literally keep cutting it until I starved the root system until it was dead. But I, it would be about impossible for me to do the same thing with a stand of Japanese stilt grass. Uh, goats don't even eat it. So it, it's not even a viable option there for some form of biological control. And so it kind of depends on what you're, what you're contending with, you know, and what kind of labor you really that you're willing to put in. There's, there's no silver bullet. People think, oh, I'm going to come listen to Dave's presentation because he's going to tell me what the silver bullet is to control my invasive problem. It's all time, money, and labor. <laughs> There's nothing easy about it. I mean, clearing my acre lot here, which borders an ag field, but some woods. And I mean, it was two weekends of hard labor getting all these plants out of the woods, you know, and onto a wagon where I could dispose of them properly. You know, it's, it was nothing easy about it. Well, it sounds like there's nothing easy about this next question either. <laughs> we have 20 acres in North Berks County near Hawk Mountain. We fought a lanthus and the autumn olive. I've been fighting pulling garlic mustard and still grass, stilt grass for years. But about five years ago, artemisin started to take over many areas along the driveway. It seems worse than ever than others. And tree of heaven, expect, I'm sorry, I can't I have to move this up. But about five years ago, Artismissa started to take over many areas along driveway. It seems worse than others except for Tree of Heaven. Are you seeing this worm wood? I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but maybe you do. <laughs> I'm trying to find it because I'm not sure of that plant that they're referring to. Would it be near the top of the list? Uh, yeah. Lee, do you want to unmute yourself? And uh, I did. Uh, so Artemisia is wormwood, and it's it's um, it's an herb that is grown for medicinal purposes. This stuff in my driveway has grown chest high. It grows underground and has like a tuber system. It's unbelievable. And it makes garlic mustard look like nothing. Oh, so I just wondered if you'd run into it. If not, if you're down in Berks County, I'm happy to show it to you. Thank you. No, I have not seen that. or I've not even heard of Artem. Artem. 
Artemisia. Yeah, interesting. I've not heard of that. I'll have to look that one up. More good news for you, huh? Honestly, Tria Heaven to me is one of the easier ones to control by comparison to some of the other things that we're dealing with. Oriental bittersweet is probably one of the most difficult that I've ever encountered. Yeah, what? Um, Oriental bittersweet will take over trees and overgrow them. It's horrible. Is is a is um, also from Lee, I think. Yeah, there's a comment right there. Yeah, yeah. So the next what one. About, what about poison hemlock? Yeah, you know that I don't have any good information personally about poison hemlock. You know, I focused on uh, more of a forestry career, and that's where I see that most often is in agriculture or roadside. So, if somebody else has any information on that, I I would have to look that up online to find out about it. How do you reintroduce native species after getting rid of the invasives? So in, in my case, I was fortunate that I don't have deer issues. And so I'm getting tremendous response of native plants. And I can even be selective and decide which of those meets my objectives. For example, I love the alternate leaf dogwood in the, in the black hall by Burnham's. So I can get rid of the black cherry and the walnuts and things like that and grow some of these shrub species that I want. If you have deer, you're going to have to plant, you're going to have to cage, you're going to have to fence, and you're going to have to continue uh, controlling bases until you get the deer in balance. In many areas, people are not able to get the deer in balance with the habitat, and they continue to struggle with that. So it kind of depends. You know, most areas, I mean, if things are in balance, we should be able to just grow native plant species without struggling. Most areas we can't because of high deer overabundance. And it isn't even some areas that there's so many deer, it's that there's just too many deer for the habitat to support. So the impact even of low numbers of deer can still be very high. And so all of hunters say, well, we're not, we're not seeing deer we're not seeing deer, but doesn't mean that the impact of the deer that live in those areas is still not very high. And so low numbers of deer and very poor habitat can still be very, very impactful. And we've had a, we have an awful history in our state of overabundance of deer for a very, very long time. Most of us don't know what our woods are supposed to look like. They've never seen it in their lifetimes. It was very eye-opening to me to move here and see what woods look like it was very abnormal to me because they're deer impacted woods joe how can i control garlic mustard oh we have a great fact sheet on garlic mustard and i've actually put this into practice and it works fantastic and it's super selective so there's a water-based version of triclopyr that uh, at the correct rate, you can put it down this time of year on those rosettes and actually be super selective before any of our other native plants, wildflower plants have even emerged. You can go and you can spot treat these garlic mustards and, and keep them from even growing. I did it last year on my property and it, it worked fantastic. Problem is you're gonna get a seed bank. So it's, it's something that you gotta continue with um, but I'll be doing that again here. I actually have it on my calendar to do this weekend and treat garlic mustard again. So check out our fact sheet. It's super effective and very selective. I've tried pulling it and pulling it and pulling it. I could show you a mountain of garlic mustard I had in my side yard. And it was so labor intensive. And, and I came back the next year, looked like I didn't do anything. So I'll, I'll never do that again. I'm going to be very selective in my approach with a herbicide. So this is a common. I've used vinegar salt spray on lesser salandine, salandine, and then when the flowers are gone, I can use glyphosate. Glyphosate, okay. Um, the next question is, how do invasives manage to leaf out earlier than natives and shed later? Is it because they are generally from more tropical regions with longer growing seasons? So that's a good question because you do wonder 
hear why they they leaf out, but no, it's not because they're from tropical regions. Most of these are from Asia and Europe that have very similar climates to what we have, but they have that ability. I'm not sure if it's just ingrained and biological in the plant. And certainly they're not native to these areas. So maybe the climates that they are from are slightly uh, different, but that is a characteristic of a lot of these invasive shrubs, not all invasive plants. For example, tree of heaven doesn't leaf out early. Um, if you get a frost on knotweed, it just knocks the heck out of it. So, but these invasive shrubs tend to leaf out early and drop their foliage later. And what about killing invasives in wetlands? Well, I will say this, it depends what you're dealing with specifically, of course, but there are aquatic labeled products that can be applied to water. It does require a permit to do that. So you have to get a permit in our state from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission to actually treat the Commonwealth's water. But there are products that are labeled to put in water. I worked in Florida for a little while for an aquatic lake management company, and we treated a lot of the invasive plants in Florida, wetlands and, and such with, with herbicides that were labeled for aquatic use. They have some tremendous stuff that they're de dealing with down there, as you can imagine, in that tropical climate stuff that came up from Brazil and whatnot. So advice on what native seed banks might hold ground against these invasives, mm -hmm. e.g. what can I plant in enlarged tree protection slash deer enclosure along with my tree seedling? I am familiar with native perennials. Are there some native annuals we should try to add to the seed bank? Yeah, interesting question. You know. If you're going to plant trees, I don't know that I would advise planting much around it because a lot of times that just ends up becoming competition for trees. So I also wrote a tree planting <laughs> publication and did a lot of work using tree shelters. And, you know, our prescription for planting trees and getting good survival on planted seedlings was really to spray <laughs> and control the weeds in some way, shape, or fashion around the base of those trees. So you didn't have that competition. You didn't have areas that were real weedy that encouraged voles to come into those areas because they tend to girdle our trees and such. So, um, you know, if anything, I would plant native wildflowers like perennials. Um, so you're not disturbing the root system in there every year. Um, perennials, tend to be less competitive than grasses, for example. And so that might be something to look at. Um, you know, putting trees into wildflower meadows, for example, might, might be an option. That seems to be a real successional natural thing that occurs in our environments. Is PA increasing deer harvests and predator protections? Yeah, actually, we do have a d new deer manager in our state that uh, has has gone back to being a little more liberal on um, what we're able to harvest. And so that's some good news. We saw that in the last last year for sure. And so we've gone back to having the concurrent buck and doe seasons the whole two weeks. And, and so we've seen that change back to kind of the, the Gary Alt era from the early 20s there. So we'll see. This is an interesting question. How do I get rid of the invasives once I pick them up? <laughs> so there's no regulation that I'm aware of that says, you know, you can't move these things around. They're not regulated in that regard. As I mentioned to you, the word ubiquitous, right? So they're everywhere already. So there's no reg that says you can't just throw it away. Um, honestly, in my woods, they all just lay on the ground now and just decompose. Um, I've seen some images where we take them and we make sure the root system's upright, maybe hang it on something where, you know, it's going to dry out and, and desiccate that way and not re-root. Um, if you have a ton of it, like we're working on a job site right now, the guys are cutting these plants and making brush piles in this owner's woodlot. And then we're going to come back and actually treat the re-sprouts in late summer. 
So we're just making brush piles out of a lot of them for wildlife. Um, I have the opportunity on my property to bring a lot of this material to the curb in my township. I actually chipped it all up for me and hauled it away. And so there's lots of different options if you can you know, dispose of it. There's no reg that says how you need to do it, really. You can even just leave it right in your woods and let it decompose. Next question is the Alanthus webworm moth. Is a, it's, just a, it's just a comment. Uh, the Alanthus webworm moth is a native moth which feeds on Tree of Heaven. Many years ago, the Cynthia moth, which is a big silk moth, fed on Tree of Heaven, but its numbers are way down and may have disappeared. It is native to East Asia. I don't know if you... Yeah, so if, and, and the comment I received from Doug Talmy in the research that I've looked up on the Atlantis webworm was that it was originally native to the south, even as far south as into Florida, and has moved up here into Pennsylvania as Tree of Heaven expanded its range. So I don't believe that originally was native to our state, but I do see it on Tree of Heaven or Atlantis. <laughs> the next one is um, interesting. There's there's a comment and then a question. Studies have shown that deer browsing young plants have seriously impacted success of many of our grown of our grown nesting birds, such as wood thrush, oven birds, etc. Can we import hunters from the west? <laughs> and the comment is actually supposed to say ground nesting birds. And so, yeah, ground nesting birds have been impacted. There's a lot of work that the U.S. Forest Service did out, did out of Warren Experiment Station here that demonstrated where forests are impacted by deer. And we're pretty famous for our ferns. Um, hay scented fern and New York fern understories can be biological de deserts, really. And so ground nesting birds can be severely impacted by them. Can we import hunters from the West? Well, Pennsylvania is one state that has almost the most hunters of any in the nation. So not, it's not that we don't have enough hunters to do the job, certainly. So it's interesting. Some of those hunter stands are getting abandoned because it says, my mile of minute is so bad, my deer hunter abandoned his stands and my plot. <laughs> That's interesting. Tell your deer hunter to pull the mile a minute behind and you'll be in good shape. <laughs> and you can just make a big compost pile of it. You don't have to haul it out of the woods. Just make a big compost pile out of it and it'll rot up. But you, it's one that's it's super shallowly rooted and you can pull it and you can save a lot of vegetation by just grabbing a hold of it and starting to pull. You'll be amazed how it comes out. And there's a comment and another question. Uh, the comment is that poison hemlock is native and only grows in wet areas. It is pretty, pretty rare. I'm not uh, going to comment on that because I'm, I see poison hemlock all along our roadsides, but I don't know enough about it to really comment. But I, I know it's not growing only in wet areas. Okay. Then the next question was, is anyone looking into using the allopathic native plants to manage non-native species? Yeah, so lelopathic native plants. So black walnut, for example. Honestly, there's some invasive plants that grow really well underneath black walnut. Like you'll find shrub honeysuckle thickets just dense under black walnut. So I'm not sure that's even a viable option. And you expand on your comment about the Game Commission getting us in sync with helping to control invasives or something to that effect? Yeah, so a lot of states have a natural resource agency. So the natural resource agency is tax funded. The natural resource agency would control not just state forest lands, but they would also control, you know, fish and wildlife management as well. In our state, fish is a a separate agency and wildlife is a separate agency. And we call it the Pennsylvania Game Commission, but it's really our wildlife management agency. Those agencies are funded by license sales. So let's take the Game Commission, for example, an agency that's funded by license sales needs to generate revenue 
by having lots of hunters, right? And how do you maintain lots of hunters? You maintain lots of hunters by having lots of deer, which is by far their biggest license sale, right? So if you put those agencies into one umbrella agency, a natural resource agency, and you say, we're managing the forest as well as the wildlife, and we're gonna make sure they're compatible, then you have a whole different impact out there when you see it adjoining states that have a natural resource tax funded agency makes, makes a big difference. And I don't know that we'll ever see that change in our state, but that's really what I was getting at. Go to, go to New York state, for example, the department of environmental conservation manages all kinds of environmental things, not just fish and wildlife and state forests but they set the regulations on the deer harvest, the season's length, the bag limits, things like that, way, way more liberal than our state is. Mm -hmm. It's a three week rifle season followed by immediately by a 10 day inline muzzleloader season, which we would never think about doing that in our state. So um, I can get all my tags right online and you know, it's, I hunt down in Virginia with my son. When you buy your hunting license, you get five tags, um, you know, right over the counter. And if you want more, you can just go buy more. So some states actually set the bag limits so the, so the landowners can actually not have deer problems. We actually make our landowners jump through hoops to get additional tags if they want to try to not have deer problems. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> so it's, it's vastly different. So the, the deer are owned by the state and the state sets the regulations. Hmm. Um, garlic mustard that is pulled out and sitting in the air will turn its flowers upward and continue to work on making seeds. We put it in garbage bags and I hate to use plastic, but we do it anyway. Yeah. I've, I've heard some other folks say that I have not, Proven that, I'd like to see if it remain viable long enough to actually produce seed. That is interesting, though. I've heard some people tell me that, that you can't just throw it on the ground. So there's some more comments about poison hemlock. Um, and then there's also a water hemlock, and it's in the wet areas, but it's not the same as poison hemlock. But both are mildly poisonous, and um, that's the comment. The next, the next question, if I can pull it up. Any idea why? Oh, I think you answered this. Well, yeah, any, idea why, that one. Yeah. any idea why the PA limits deer harvest? I think you answered that. Yeah, I mean, we, we've gone from a long history of what we call traditional deer management when deer numbers were very low in the turn of the last century in the early 1900s there. I mean, deer were almost extirpated and so we've kind of gotten into that traditional mode and really just more recently in the 2000s, I'd say trying to go to more of a quality deer management, which is part of that philosophy is keeping deer in balance with their habitat. And so hopefully we continue to turn that corner and, and see some improvements there. And here's a comment. I leave garlic mustard to cook in black, black plastic bags for a week and can then combine the entire haul into just one plastic bag for final disposal. Mm -hmm. I do all the work on the gravel driveway. I can flame any ceilings that might emerge later. <laughs> I just spray mine with triclopyr. <laughs> we have a big kudzu, kudzu. Vine, kudzu. kudzu vine problem. How can I get rid of it? Oh, man. Yeah, that one... Uh, and you know, we had where I worked in Virginia. I don't have an answer for you, to be honest with you. It's not something I've worked with more on the research end of things. And it wasn't, it's not a plant present where I've worked up here. It's a, it's more adapted to Southern parts of the U S we have it in just barely in the Southeastern Pennsylvania. Do we have kudzu? It is we do we have kudzu it is edible i always wonder why they don't feed it to cattle <laughs> no idea i think actually it was brought in initially as a cattle food and a stream bank stabilization so 
I mean, we Somebody were says goats love kudzu. Yeah, see, I think that's why it was brought in initially, but it has invasive characteristics. And so if it's invasive, it can take over areas. And I've seen it just do unbelievable things down in Virginia. So is there an, a, um, an extension at Penn State that would have some good information on kudzu? Uh, you'd probably want to look further south, I would bet you, from Alabama to you know, Clemson and South Carolina or something probably have more information on that than we do. Another comment, the roots are, I heard the roots are edible. Hmm. I don't know. I don't either. Joe, is there another question? I do not see any. Right. I, think we're, I think we're out of questions here, David. <laughs> I, have, I have one being a chemist. Um, okay. Is there, you say that it's chemistry specific, are they, are they tied to any of the biological or genetic makeup of the plants? In this, in what regard, like you mean the herbicides that we use? Yeah. Well, certainly they're tied to how the plants uh, reproduce themselves, whether they're you know, annuals versus perennials, whereas they're monocots versus dicots, you know, grasses versus broadleaves, things like that, conifers versus uh, deciduous plants. And so that, there are certainly herbicides that are created for the different kinds of plants, and that's based on the, how that product actually works. So there are, there are products, for example, that only work on the actual process of seed germination. Okay, that's what, yeah. So you figure out that chemistry and you stop one part of that chemical reaction. Right. And then that's how it, how it works. For example, like glyphosate, for example, prevents a plant from producing an amino acid that it needs to build proteins and when it can't build those proteins, she's <laughs> right. actually yes. looking at it. Got the it. Plant ends up dying. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Any final comments or questions from anybody? <laughs> oh my garlic mustard would love. <laughs> I have right. three new messages here. Did you? Um... Yeah, they're just comments. I looked at them. Okay. Okay. So then, um, Phil, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure Phil's on. Um, oh. I'm going to stop yeah, so, sharing, I guess, folks. Yeah, yeah, David, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. Um, oh, there's Phil. Oh, real quickly, if I may, just I think this is a good comment. Um, where do we get the pamphlets on the current slide that was posted? Oh, on that last slide, yeah. Is that Penn State is, Extension? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a there's a page on Penn State Extension. Let me just share that again. I'll just walk you through it since there was a question on that. So if you go to, the, go to Penn State Extension, there's a little menu button at the top of the page, and you drop down that menu and go to Forest Management, Invasive, and Competing Plants, and you'll find all the resources that I helped create there. Great, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot there. That's how I found David in the first place. Um, yeah, I did my master's degree originally on a publication called Herbicides and Forest Vegetation Management. And so that was one of the first publications that went up on the site. And then from there, we, we branched out. We have everything from calibrating a backpack sprayer to all these invasive plant fact sheets, application method fact sheets. So if you don't know how to do a hack and squirt or basil bark, you know, there's fact sheets on those methods as well. Um, we just produced a video on doing stump treatments and had planned on doing others on videos on application methods. But yeah, there there's a lot of good resources there. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you very much, David. Yes. For yeah. You sharing your expertise and your, your time with uh, our Morea crew here. Obviously there was a lot of interest, so. Um, yeah, most everybody's dealing with these things in one way or another, unfortunately. <laughs>